All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Fox Nation special, Trump on Trial. We're live. I'm Brian Kilmeade. The first week of former President Trump's historic criminal trial coming to a close. Trump expected to depart the courthouse at any moment. We're going to bring you the live coverage outside as we wait to see what he's going to say. And I'm positive he's going to talk. Just a hunch I have. And we'll stop, uh, we'll stop our panel. We'll listen in. Then we'll come back and analyze it. Trump spoke briefly to the cameras this morning, slamming the gag order issued against him. He called it unconstitutional. All right, after four days of jury selection, the trial is now moving on to opening statements. That'll be on Monday. Joining me now to discuss what went down in the courtroom today, federal defense attorney Ronald Chapman. But Ronald, is it necessarily a bad thing that it's speedy? I mean, do you think that is it uh, the longer the deliberation, is it typically better for the defendant? You know, that's really hard to tell, and you've got to look at the type of trial it is. For a case like this, I would expect a long deliberation. We have no idea what type of people are on the jury because jury selection was, as you just talked about, so absolutely short that we really don't know who these people are. But when they get back in that jury room to decide these very important facts of this case, I would expect them to take a significant amount of time given the issues at stake. That being said, with Bragg's prosecution and with the likely inability to prove that crime, that felony that they need to prove, I wouldn't be surprised if this jury quickly returned something close to an acquittal or maybe even a hung jury. That would, that would be something. Uh, Ron, uh, so let's talk about opening arguments. It looks like whether you like it or not, it, the speed matters. You heard Donald Trump say, really not helping me. It's helping the judge who wants to get it over with. Let's talk about opening arguments for the, for the uh, prosecution first off. They don't yeah. want to name, I understand it's atypical, they don't want to name their first few witnesses. So they're, they say they're afraid of their names getting out and Donald Trump besmirching them over the weekend. So having said that, what should your opening argument be if you're the prosecution? It's- so if I'm only the prosecution, a-, a prosecutor has a duty to make sure that there's clarity in their opening statement, that the jury knows what the elements of the offense are, that the jury knows the roadmap. So we know from Alvin Bragg's beautiful factual statement that he developed and put out earlier exactly what uh, his prosecutor should say during that opening. And then the question will be for everybody listening to that opening argument, which of the three theories did Al- that Alvin Bragg articulated is the one that he's going to go off of in order to prove that underlying felony crime that he has to prove? Is it a campaign violation? That doesn't make sense. Is it the fact that he's trying to defraud the American people related to the election? Not within his power to prosecute. So I'll be watching that very closely to see if his prosecutors line up those dots and actually make sense to the jury. How long does it, Ron, okay, go ahead, sorry. And by the end of this case, the jury will know exactly what Alvin Bragg is required to prove if the defense is doing their job, and they will spot that gap if he doesn't go far enough. All right, just how long does it last? Uh, What's a good opening argument? how much time? Knowing you got to keep people's attention, you got to be crisp, but at the same time, you got to be thorough. That, that's right. You, you, those are all of the elements of a great opening statement. I would expect that if you're usually going longer than about two hours, you're going to bore the jury. Okay. okay. If I'm the prosecutor here, I'll keep it at about 90 minutes, but it's, it's a huge case, and uh, maybe they'll take longer under this type of pressure. So, all right. So I was on, on One Nation this week, and I'm going to talk to James Trusty, and he's another steam lawyer. And I just got his talking points, and one of them, which is, uh, if I'm defense, Ron, I go for Michael Cohen. And I, oh, I try to yeah. destroy his credibility, which should not be hard, get him talking in circles, which should not be hard, study his tapes to find out what he's been saying, get in the contradictions. Uh, is that the key to success here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. When you're a criminal defense attorney, you want to look for that weak witness, the one who will say anything that they possibly can, the one who can't keep their story straight. And I couldn't imagine a better player in that ring than, than Michael Cohen himself. I mean, look, he didn't sign his cooperation agreement when he was prosecuted previously. Everybody thinks he was prosecuted for a campaign violation, but this guy was committing fraud all over the place. Tax violations in the millions. You know that you've got the New York tax stamp issue or the taxi stamp issue. Um, that he didn't deal with properly. Michael Cohen is going to be the easiest person to cross-examine. And the fact that the prosecution would trust him enough to make him a critical part of the case is a massive mistake. When Michael Cohen gets up on that witness stand 
uh, uh, for cross-examination, every one of his bad acts, his dishonesty, his lies, mm. his prior statements will come in full view of the courtroom and uh, an acquittal should soon follow if we have a fair and impartial jury. And just so you know, this is one thing that's undeniable. A check was written to Stormy Daniels and to McD uh, Karen McDougal, and it was a check written if it was to keep them quiet while he's running for president because of personal embarrassment, that's not a problem, right? The thing they want to show is that he used campaign funds to do it in order to change, make sure he uh, did better, did, went out and won this election or didn't lose it. That's the issue. They have to prove that he did this to win an election. It's not a matter of writing a check. You're allowed to do that to keep something out of the press. That's it. And, and let me just add that one, one glaring um, issue for Michael Cohen's cross-examination is in his plea agreement, uh, there's no reference to the fact that Donald Trump directed that check to be made. Michael Cohen added that after the fact in his own statement. That, that critical part of the case really hinges on Cohen's words alone. Right. I also understand, uh, Ron, that when Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels get on the stand, the defense should not try to defend, defame them. There's a strategy out there, maybe you don't subscribe to it, maybe you do, that back off. They're not the problem. You, know, you don't want to go out there and make them uh, the, bad, uh, the bad person, the evildoer, because there's a lot of women on this jury, and they don't really want to see a guy beat up on them, and if something happened to him, it happened to him, but that's not the <coughs> issue. That, that's exactly right. There's really no need to. I mean, listen, uh, these, these two people are going to get on the stand and talk about potentially sexual relationships with Donald Trump. At the end of the day, that does not need to be challenged. As much as Trump might want it challenged, you don't fight that fight. The fight that you fight is the one against Michael Cohen, and you largely sidestep these witnesses, and you don't need to make them seem uh, not credible. The reality is, is that the prosecution is going to fall into their own trap when they think that putting Donald Trump's dirty business out in front of this jury is really going to change things, um, they're going to have a bit of a rude awakening when the jury realizes that we didn't need to spend all the time on this story and that was only done so that you could avoid talking about the real issue. And, and that is exactly uh, what they should be proving, uh, the underlying felony offense, which they can't get to. So uh, Stormy Daniels going to be a huge distraction in this case that Alvin Bragg will try to play out for as long as possible. So, All right, uh, Ron, real quick. You know, I love that moment when Donald Trump walked out of court and he started reading articles because he understands something very important here. You can't be gagged from saying what people who have a First Amendment protection have already said. And he's going to continue to repeat those statements. And if the judge tries to do anything, he's got an immediate appealable issue. Um, and even if there is a conviction, he gets to claim that the gag order prevented him from being able to contribute in a meaningful way to this election, something way more important to this country. One last time, we got 90 seconds. Uh, there was word is they want to get this done by Memorial Day. Jason, is that what do you think, Ron? Agreed. Very fast. I think that the judge is also going to do everything he can to speed this case along and get business rolling in New York like it should be. Guys, awesome hour. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We'll do this again on Fox Nation. That does it for us right here. Uh, wrapping up the first week of former President Trump's historic criminal trial. Thank you, Ron Chabon.